Hi all, and welcome to the Medical AI Lab talk series. I'm delighted that today we have Brian Sotniko present deep learning in ophthalmology. Uh, looking forward to your talk, Brian, take it away. Sure, thanks Pranav. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, well, thank you everyone for tuning in and being here today. Um, thanks Pranav for inviting me. Um, today I'll be giving a talk on deep learning and ophthalmology and I'm a Stanford ophthalmology research resident. I have no financial interests to disclose. So for the outline of this talk, uh, I'll go ahead and give an introduction to ophthalmology as a medical profession. And for today, I decided to go ahead and do a deep dive into one of the applications of AI in, in ophthalmology, specifically on the diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy. And um, I decided to go through a number of different features of um, using AI for this use, particular use case. Um, and then I'll just conclude with one slide, just kind of with some inspirational examples of, of other applications uh, in ophthalmology. So what is ophthalmology and uh, why are we talking about it here today? Um, I hope I can convince all of you uh, that ophthalmology is, is a really, really fascinating uh, part of medicine. Um, it involves the diagnosis and treatment of eye disorders. And I think for most of us, uh, we will at some point have some interaction uh, with ophthalmology. Uh, maybe it's um, a family member that has diabetes and will have diabetic retinopathy. Maybe it's our grandparents who uh, develop age-related macular degeneration and have trouble seeing as they get older. Or um, at least most of us will develop cataract at some point in older age and may require cataract surgery. Um, some of us may have had LASIK surgery in the past to correct for uh, myopia and nearsightedness. So the potential of AI in ophthalmology is that it can help uh, a lot of different people and improve the quality of life for many. I figured I'd review a little bit about the eye and the structures, because I think it's important for understanding um, the applications of AI in ophthalmology. So uh, this is a picture of, of the eye and the front part of the eye, it's divided into two, two parts actually, the anterior segment and the posterior segment of the eye. Um, the anterior segment has uh, a structure called the cornea. That's a translucent uh, part of the eye that allows the light to be uh, to enter and, uh, and, and become focused towards the retina. And um, there's an iris that can kind of controls the amount of light that reaches uh, the eye, uh, the, the retina. Uh, there's a lens that continues to do more focusing and uh, focuses the image to the retina. There's a jelly-like material in the middle of the eye called the vitreous. And at the back of the eye is the retina, which is access like the sensor in a camera. Uh, the retina converts the light and photon energy into electrical signals, which then goes back to the brain uh, via the optic nerve. So um, in many diseases, uh, it affects different structures in the, in the eye. So in diabetes, it affects a lot of the micro vessels. In glaucoma, it affects the optic nerve, um, cataracts the lens and so on. One of the great things about ophthalmology for a, the purposes of AI is that it, we use a lot of imaging modalities uh, in the clinical specialty. So um, on the left-hand side is fundus photograph. Fundus refers to the back of the eye. Uh, photograph is just exactly what it sounds like. Just we illuminate the back of the eye with a flash and a camera uh, takes a picture of the back of the eye. You can see here this kind of whitish uh, circle is the optic nerve. And these are the vessels that uh, exit from the same region, um, which supply oxygen to the retina. Um, this dark spot in the middle of the image is the macula, where you have the highest central vision uh, or the highest visual acuity. And a lot of diseases um, like diabetes in, in certain cases and age-related macular degeneration affect this macula, which is uh, why you have um, a lot of vision, um, threat to vision and, and blindness from those conditions. Um, 
Other types of imaging tools that are common are something called a forcing angiogram. So in this case, a special dye called forcing is injected into the vein of the patient and the dye circulates in the bloodstream and uh, can be captured um, with a special uh, camera with some filters uh, inside of it. Um, this can give us an idea of uh, some of the changes in the, in the vessels of the patient. Um, one other technology that's commonly used in ophthalmology is something called OCT or optical coherence tomography. What you're seeing here is a cross-sectional photo of, of a region of the eye. So instead of looking at um, the, the back of the retina, like on an on FOSS projection, like the photograph and angiogram, here you're seeing a tomogram or a cross-section of the macula. This little divot in the center is is called the fovea, that's the same area uh, where you have uh, high visual acuity, and uh, that's normal for uh, every, every human. Um, there's a lot of other different imaging techniques um, that I won't mention now, but uh, I think this is really great for AI because we can um, collect these data sets and, 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 and model um, off of the images. So a little bit about diabetic retinopathy. Um, diabetes is a disease where you have trouble uh, regulating glucose in the body. Um, so uh, patients will have high blood sugars and those blood sugars can damage uh, both large and small vessels in the body. Uh, particularly in the eye, there's a lot of small vessels and um, over time, um, you know, 600 million people will have diabetes by 2040 and a third of them will have some sort of retinopathy. Um, there's various stages of retinopathy and some are um, more mild than others um, and um, some can be more threatening to the vision. Um, this chart on the right kind of shows that as you have diabetes for longer periods of time, the prevalence of diabetes is, is increased. So the longer you have diabetes, the more likely you're going to have uh, diabetic retinopathy. Um, the shaded lines are ones are patients who have or, in, or, or rely on insulin. So they have more severe types of diabetes. And so um, they have more likely to have a worse um, diabetic retinopathy over time. On imaging, uh, diabetes uh, or diabetic retinopathy has um, very characteristic findings. And um, these are just a few of them that can be, uh, that doctors like to, to look at to kind of characterize and, and classify how severe the diabetic retinopathy is. Um, and these can be, of course, um, uh, looked at by machine learning models to do classification. Um, one of the first papers that uh, used a convolutional neural network to uh, do classification was by Abramoff et al. in 2016. Uh, he used a data set called the Mesador 2 data set for um, validation and uh, basically had a, about 874 subjects with 1748 images that were independently graded by three retinal specialists using a, spe using a standard scale. He um, used a software from a company uh, called IDX software that had several um, detection networks um, all kind of based on AlexNet, which detected some of those features I just showed in the last slide, such as hemorrhages, exudates, neovascularization, et cetera. And then the outputs of those individual networks refused uh, to do a classification task, uh, specifically to determine if the diabetic retinopathy should be referred to a, a higher specialist or whether diabetic retinopathy was vision threatening. And uh, he showed that the AUC was quite good, 8.98 for uh, both those tasks. And uh, this data set is publicly available um, on this link. Um, in another uh, paper in 2016, Goshen et al., um, I think this is by the team at Google, uh, published in JAMA a different um, data set called IPAX1 that had 990 or 9,900 uh, images from 5,000 patients. And they use the Inception V3 model. Um, and again, they were able to classify um, presence of a referable diabetic retinopathy with an AUC of 0.99 for 
for uh, the IPAX data set. And again, they also check um, and validate it against the Mesador 2 data set, which was used in the last paper. And this data set can also be found uh, on Kaggle. So it's great that we have these uh, models and they're actually being commercialized now. Um, one of the great things is that last year, um, uh, Medicare approved a special code for the um, authorization of using uh, AI to uh, pay for, uh, for, for AI to diagnose diabetic retinopathy and, and uh, similar diseases. And so it can be actually be reimbursed uh, by insurance um, going forward. And um, we hope that more codes will be released in the future for ophthalmology. Um, so there's several companies trying to do this now. And um, interestingly, Stanford also has um, a status program where they have some of these devices at various primary care clinics uh, throughout the Bay Area, and images can be taken by um, technicians in those primary care clinics and be evaluated by AI algorithms and also triage to um, retina specialists um, here at Stanford. So um, it's very exciting because um, I think it's um, it's, it's nice to see that the, 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 the techno technology has been translated, um, is being translated towards real clinical use. Um, Google and Verily also um, tried to implement their technology in Thailand. And I think this paper is really interesting. It's um, basically how they uh, tried to implement this deep learning system in, in Thailand. And uh, you can see here in, in the left, um, like a nurse taking photos and there's like a computer where um, the photos were uploaded to a cloud-based um, machine learning uh, system. And uh, you can see on the right uh, that there would be some features that would be reported back to the, um, the, uh, the nurse and the patient could then you know, decide whether to, they should go to a, a retina doctor um, for further treatment. And uh, they were able to, you know, um, reduce the time it takes for a patient to get some results. Um, you know, normally a patient might have to wait to see an ophthalmologist, but here they could have just an AI system take um, evaluate the photo for them, and so that saved a lot of time. Um, however, they did notice um, some challenges that they ran into that mainly had to do with the implementation of the model. So. Uh, they noticed that um, it was sometimes hard for uh, nurses to take the photos and have good enough quality to be gradable by the AI system. And it ended up being that 21% of the images were ungradable so that, you know, it led to a lot of user frustration because um, the images were ungradable and, and therefore the patients were waiting there for a long time and didn't um, end up actually getting a result. And um, one thing that they ran into uh, was that uh, because they had a cloud-based uh, machine learning model, um, they uh, experienced a lot of network connectivity issues at their clinic. And you know there are a lot of problems uploading the data and um, there was about a minute uh, to a minute and a half of upload times and there was a lot of delays. So um, I think it's interesting that um, although the model itself may have been trained really well, there was, a lot of implementation issues um, in, in real life in, in practice. Um, and that brings me to the, this slide uh, by uh, Dr. Shaw at Stanford, who works on implementing AI models. And I think a lot of times we focus a lot on the second box here, developing ML models to be accurate. Um, however, uh, implementing them in clinical practice uh, sometimes requires uh, you to kind of do some um, some more research into how they might be used and, um, and how they would be implemented. Um, I found that this more recent paper about diabetic retinopathy uh, diagnosis uh, kind of tried to solve some of those problems that were mentioned in the, in, uh, just mentioned. So this came out from China and apparently um, uh, China will have one of the largest populations of diabetes uh, people with diabetes in the coming years. And they have a dearth of ophthalmologists, meaning that they don't have enough ophthalmologists to care for um, all those people with diabetic retinopathy. So uh, they have a great interest in developing AI models to help um, triage patients. Here they use a much larger data set than 
those previous papers I mentioned, here they had um, 666,000 uh, images. And um, they tried to solve some of the challenges with implementation, I think, than those previous models by having a bunch of sub -net networks um, do various tasks, including this first uh, sub network that um, detects um, whether the image is gradable, and they had a whole number of a whole scoring system to grade whether an image is gradable or not. And they also had some other sub networks to um, do segmentation on the images and then feed those segmentation um, features uh, finally to the um, end network, which did grading um, on both the original image plus the features um, uh, derived from segmentation. So um, they kind of shared the parameters from this early network, this first network here, which was trained on ImageNet, as well as some of their uh, images from the data set, and then shared those parameters with all these uh, sub-networks. Um, they performed external validation on three data sets, two from China and one from the US, the IPAX data set. Um, and this is some example of their um, segmentation results. So their sub-network was able to identify um, some of those features important in diabetic retinopathy classification. And, um, you know, they were able to locally validate and externally validate their model and with good AUC scores. Um, I found it interesting that um, the AUC score for uh, an American-based data set, um, the IPAX, uh, was not really that different from the Chinese data sets. So um, kind of interesting that the model would um, be generalizable and from those different populations. And um, I thought that was interesting. So um, I'll just kind of wrap up with uh, just some other interesting use cases. So deep learning in ophthalmology. So. Um, diabetic retinopathy in this chart is kind of shows um, it's the most published area of AI in ophthalmology. But, you know, there's other areas where AI, I think, will have great um, effects. So glaucoma, um, age-related macro degeneration, cataract, and retinopathy prematurity. I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in these areas as well uh, to, to see how AI might be useful there. Um, there's some other AI models that have been shown um, to use on those OCT images that I mentioned previously to predict disease progression. Um, there's been work to show that uh, fundus images can be used to predict cardiovascular risk and age and gender um, just by looking at the images. And um, there's also been work to see if AI can be useful in the surgery uh, in the operating room. So whether they could be useful for teaching, um, annotating tools, things like that. Um, so I'll just wrap up with um, these references here. Uh, these are some of the review articles that I used to make this presentation. And uh, yeah, thanks for all for listening. Uh, happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Brian.